Oh, welcome to this time and to this space. God is here. He's the one that's drawn us here. Thankful to see all of your faces. Thankful that others are joining us online. Welcome to you as well. May we know God's presence here today. That's, our, that's really our heart's desire, even if we didn't express it as we came this morning. There's something inside us that longs to meet with God. And in fact, that's what brings us here to this time. It's a longing deep within, a longing that God's given within us to meet with Him. I'm going to invite you to stand as I share this word from Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah 57, 15. It says, Living 
seated. So what is it that makes our hearts ache for this God? We're made in His image. We're made to be like Him and to be in relationship with Him. And yet that relationship at some point in the very distant past was broken. And in some ways remains broken. In fact, in every way remains broken until it's restored in Jesus. 
I want to read just a couple paragraphs from one of our, our church's confessions, our testimonies. Our world belongs to God. And it reminds us of that, that early time when fellowship with God was broken. It's kind of the bad news, we could say, before the good news. It's the bad news that makes the good news so very, very good. It says, in the beginning of human history, our first parents walked with God. But rather than living by the Creator's word of life, they listened to the serpent's lie. And they fell into sin. In their rebellion, they tried to be like God. And as sinners, Adam and Eve feared, now feared, the closeness of God, the presence of God, that, that presence that they once so enjoyed walking with Him. They now feared the nearness of God and they hid. And fallen in that very first sin, we prove each day that apart from grace, we are guilty sinners. We fail to thank God. We break God's laws. We ignore our tasks. Looking for life without God, we find death. Grasping for freedom outside of the law, we trap ourselves in Satan's snares. Pursuing pleasure, we lose the gift of joy. If the human story ended there, what a life this would be. What a horror this life would be. And yet, and yet, the good news of the gospel follows the bad news. Article 24 and 25, when we read just a little further, say this. As the second Adam, Jesus chose the path that Adam, the first Adam, and that we had rejected. In his baptism and temptations, in his teaching and miracles, in his battles with demons, and with his friendships with sinners, Jesus lived a full and righteous human life before us. As God's true Son, he lovingly obeyed the Father and made present in deed and word the coming rule of God. And then, then, standing in our place, Jesus suffered during his years on earth, especially in the tortures of the cross. He carried God's judgment on our sin, and his sacrifice removed our guilt. But God raised him from the dead. He walked out of the grave, the Lord of life. And now we are set right with God. We are given new life and called to walk with him in freedom from sin's dominion. Is there an amen anywhere out there? Amen. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you for the good news that follows the bad news. We thank you that though our first parents and we like them had fallen from your grace, had stepped outside of your goodness, had rejected all that you desired for us. Even though all of that is true, you, in your abundant goodness, sent your Son Jesus. In covenant faithfulness, you stuck with us, even when we refused to stick with you. And now, O oh God, rather than a life of slavery, we know a life of freedom. Freedom in Him. Rather than a life of a pity and of sorrow, we know a life of joy, walking in His footsteps. We praise You and give You thanks for the life that is ours. In Jesus' name, Amen. Sorry, right, now we're going to sing this song. Then they're going to collect the money. Then, children, that's when you get to go downstairs. So just a few minutes.
service now we will have an offering and our offering this morning is not an obligation but an act of free will and our offering this morning is for uh, world renew with an emphasis on providing clean water around the world so may god <coughs> bless you as we support this ministry together Complete till my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through. 
thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the privilege of being able to worship here together as a body of believers. And we thank you, Lord, that we can support um, our arm of ministry and our denomination, World Renew. And especially, Lord, we pray that they would work, be able to work successfully on this project to provide clean water around this world. <coughs> it's something that we take uh, so often for granted, and we just pray for this ministry, and we pray this all together in your name. Amen. Could I have the children who are going to go to JK and SK? In the fall, could they come up, please? Just sit right here on the steps. All right. Now. I don't have a flashlight this time, but I've got a bag full of goodies. And I want you to tell me, don't tell me what they are, just look at them. Okay, what's the same about all of these? Are they all blue? No. Are they all brown? No. Are they all Kawartha Dairy ice cream lids? <laughs> well, what's the same? Do they all have something the same? Now what am I going to do? Hmm. Which one looks different? The book. Right. Why Why does it look different? Oh, no, no. No. No, because this this lid here is brown. This is a brown lid from chocolate milk powder. It's brown, so you're right, the book is different, but why is it different? Because it's black. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, anybody from the, ch from the audience? Lucy. It's rectangle. Aha! It's a different shape. What are all these shapes? Do you know your shapes? Okay, what are, what are all these shapes? A rectangle. This is a rectangle, but what are all the rest of them? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what's the same with all these things? They are all 
Circles, yay! <laughs> okay, now, there's lots of circles in the world. And you know what? It's a really cool thing about a circle. It doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have a beginning. And it doesn't have an end. It just goes around and on and on and around and around. That's what a circle does. And you know what else does that? God's love. God's, God's love is like a circle, a circle big and round. For when we make a circle, no ending can be found. And so the love of Jesus goes on eternally. Forever and forever, I know that God loves me. See? A circle. Just keeps going around and around and around. And God's love for you never stops either. It just keeps going and going and going and going. How come the world does that? Yes. All right, you may go to Sunday school. If you are going to JK or SK, you may go to Sunday school that way, and Mrs. Curell is waiting for you. Okay? Can you go? You know where to go, hey? Eh? Well, we have very smart children. <laughs> poor fella, his grandpa's a pastor and his dad's a pastor. <laughs> and so he's got, he's got uh, that speaking in him. <laughs> well, I am so glad to be with you again this morning. Um, my mic wasn't on at the beginning, so I want to welcome you at home. If you were not able to hear me earlier, welcome to you as well. We're turning this morning to Luke 24. And if you remember last week, we looked at John 20, which was that first Easter evening. And this morning, as we turn to Luke 24, we're looking at that first Easter afternoon. And um, so we're kind of on, uh, you know, we're kind of doing it backwards. We're going evening, afternoon instead of afternoon, evening. But that's okay. That's all good. Luke 24, and we're turning to verse 13. And we're going to read this perhaps familiar story to many of you, perhaps new to some of us. It's, it's called, at least in the New International Version, there's sort of a subheading there, um, which of course isn't part of the original Bible text, but the editors, the translators, add headings to help us kind of follow along. And the heading here is, On the Road to Emmaus. I'll talk a little bit later about Emmaus and and where it was exactly. But we begin at verse 13 in Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened and they talked and discussed these things with each other. Uh, sorry, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you, as you walk along? Well, they stood still, their faces downcast, and one of them named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. 
But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to return Israel, redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us the, they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but, but him they did not see. He said to them, Oh, foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses... And all the prophets, he explained to them that what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Well, as they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further, but, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, the day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while well, he talked with us on the road and, and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen, and he's appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Thanks be to God. You know, if anyone ever needed convincing that God has a sense of humor, this would be a good passage to bring them to. It's, it's Easter afternoon, right? I said that. And, and two of Jesus' followers, one of whom is, is named for us, Cleopas, two of Jesus' followers are traveling from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now, Emmaus was about 11 kilometers away, so, you know, we're talking roughly two hours at a really good pace, maybe three hours of walking. They had been to, to Jerusalem, right? People came for the great feasts from all over Jerusalem, they, or from all over Israel, they came to Jerusalem. These, these two obviously came from Emmaus. They had been there for Passover, but what they ended up witnessing, what they actually ended up being part of, was Jesus' crucifixion. And they were still baffled by the whole thing. It made no sense. But they, they, they can't stay in Jerusalem forever trying to, trying to process it all. They've been there for a couple days already after his crucifixion. But they've got to they've be on their way home. They've got to get back to their farms and, and back to their flocks or maybe back to their weaving looms, back to their, their pottery wheels. There's work to do. And suddenly, without any warning whatsoever, without any, kinds of, without any kind of heads up, without, without any introduction, the very person that they can't stop talking about, Jesus is walking right alongside them. But here's the thing, they don't recognize him. Jesus' resurrected body is, is somehow different. I mean, there, there's continuity there as well, to be sure. It was Jesus, after all. And so clearly, you know, he's not an entirely different person. There's many things the same. But there's enough differences that Jesus wasn't immediately recognizable. 
Actually, they were kept from recognizing him is the way that our text puts it. But it doesn't tell us, you know, what, or it doesn't tell us who kept them from, from recognizing him. And it doesn't tell us why either that they were kept from recognizing him. I sometimes, I sometimes wonder as I read this passage, so was it, was it God that was keeping them somehow from, from recognizing Jesus? Maybe he had, maybe he had something new uh, to reveal to them, to teach to them before, before he revealed who he was. Or was it, was it possibly Satan that was keeping them, sort of blinding them from recognizing Jesus? He certainly didn't want them to know who it was. Or maybe, maybe it was simply the blindness of Cleopas and his companion themselves. Their, their own blindness that kept them from recognizing him. That's, that's my guess, actually. Because typically, we see what we expect to see. Isn't that true? I mean, it, it was certainly true for Cleopas and his unnamed friend, Let's, let's call him Fred, this, this, this unnamed friend. Cleopas and Fred weren't expecting to see Jesus, and so they were kept from seeing Jesus. They weren't expecting him, and so they didn't recognize him. It really could be that simple. So although, although their conversation was all about Jesus, they didn't recognize him when he, when he caught up with them on the road and was suddenly walking alongside them. So guys, what's, what's up? Nice day. What do you mean, what's up? You're like the only person in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened there this weekend? Now, now I try to picture Jesus at that moment. He's like, mm, yeah, I, I maybe heard something about that. And then, then Cleopas goes off on this rant, right? This, this Jesus was a powerful prophet. We were convinced he was the Messiah. We were sure he was going to redeem Israel. But then suddenly he was handed over, sentenced, crucified. All that was three days ago, but now, this morning, some of our women say, he's gone. He's gone from the tomb and not stolen either, at least not according to them anyway. They said they saw angels who said he was alive. And all the while, you know, I'm just imagining what Jesus, all the while Jesus is just kind of nodding, I guess, trying to look serious. Wow. That's interesting, he finally says. But isn't that exactly what Moses and the prophets said would happen to the Messiah? That he would suffer death and then enter glory? And still, Cleopas and Fred don't get it. He's revealed himself in the scriptures. He's walked them through. It's like the porch light's on, but no one's home. And it's not until they finally reach Emmaus and Jesus gets invited to stay for dinner that the reality dawns on them. Jesus takes bread, gives thanks, and breaks it, and then begins to distribute it. And that's the moment that it finally clicks. Maybe, maybe it was something in his gesture, maybe, that, you know, it was something that, that reminded them instantly of Jesus. Or maybe, maybe something in the tone of his voice. I don't know, but, but the Tetris blocks finally fall into place. But no sooner do they get it than Jesus is gone. He disappears, it says. I love it. I and mean, just, just try and tell me that there's not humor in this story. But then, then there's something else, too, that's not quite as funny. 
In fact, something that's actually quite tragic in this story. And it's this. You and me are Cleopas and Fred. That's the part of the story that's not so funny. Me and you, in a sense, are the ones on the Emmaus Road who sometimes completely miss Jesus, even though he's right at our side. You're not, you're not Fred literally, of course. I'm not, I'm not Cleopas physically. That's not obviously my point. But I know that far too often more often than I'd like to admit, Jesus joins me on the road and I'm 100% oblivious to it. Of course, it wasn't just true for Cleopas and Fred. It's not just true for me either. We see it elsewhere in Scripture. In fact, earlier that same day, we all know this story, it was true for Mary Magdalene as well. In John 20, it says that on the first Easter morning, she was standing at the empty tomb. But even then, standing at the empty tomb, even then, when she turned around and saw Jesus, she didn't recognize him. Hello? (laughs) Empty tomb? Jesus, I don't see it. In his book, the remarkable ordinary, Frederick Buechner says this. He says it's so easy, so easy to look and see what we pass through in this world, but we don't. We don't. If you're like me, Buechner says, if you're like me, you see so little. You see what you expect to see rather than what's really there. Mary saw what she expected to see. The gardener. It's who you expect to see early in the morning in a garden. How often, I wonder, do we we miss the true and risen Jesus simply because we're not expecting to see Him? We're not expecting Him to show up. We're not expecting Him to be in the office beside me. Not expecting him to be in the fields while I'm on my tractor. We're not expecting him, and so we don't see him. We're not paying attention. I have a, I have a spiritual director that I meet with by Zoom once a month. And in one of our meetings, this is some time ago now, In one of our meetings, she said to me, one of the most important spiritual disciplines is attentiveness. And I sort of said, when I think of spiritual disciplines, I mean, I think of prayer, I think of Bible study, um, I think of worship for sure, I think of I think of fasting. There's all sorts of things I think of with spiritual disciplines, Sabbath and, and, and solitude. But my spiritual director said I need to practice the spiritual discipline of attentiveness. Attentiveness? Why? What was she getting at? She was, in effect, warning me against being a Cleopas or a friend. Live alert to what God is doing. That's what she was telling me. Live being consciously, deliberately, intentionally aware of what he's up to. Aware of where he's at work. Aware of the times throughout my day where he is making his presence known. The key is paying attention. The key is noticing When we think of experiencing God more fully, more deeply, when we think of encountering God, often what comes to our mind, we are thinking of the big moment. You know, the tingle, I trust you've had this from time to time, the the sort of tingle down the spine experience, you know what 
what I'm speaking of, kind of the supernatural encounter where God breaks in in a way that's obvious and clear. But what if what Paul is saying is true, that in him we live and move and have our very being? Then the key to experiencing God more fully is to be looking for him in the everyday He's right in my movements. He's right in my space. He's right with me. If he's as close as the air I breathe, then I should be paying attention. I should be deliberately noticing where he's at work right in front of my face in the everyday moments. Every day. To me, I don't know how you hear that, but to me, I hear that as a huge encouragement. You know, Jenny Jenny and I had the privilege of being part of a trip to Israel in, in 2019. It was one of those big moments for us, one of those spine tingling moments several times while we were there. 16 days covering the land where where Jesus walked. Awesome. I wouldn't wouldn't trade that trip for almost anything. But you see, the reality, what Cleopas and Fred would want us to know, is that the reality is you don't need to go on a spiritual pilgrimage to some distant place in order to meet Jesus. You don't have to go to the latest, greatest conference. You don't have to go on a mission trip to some exotic locale. You don't have to, you know, be part of a worship service with the stage lighting and the fog machines and all the, all the doodads and, you know, fancy. All of that may be good and, in fact, even helpful. But to me, it's such a huge encouragement to know that I can start right in my own backyard. You can start right in your own backyard. Jesus is there. Jesus is there waiting to be found. If only I'll open my eyes. If only I'll pay attention. If only I'll open my eyes to truly see. So how do you do that? How how do you become more attentive? Well, one way, and I'm sure, you know, there's hundreds of ways. One way that I've practiced in different seasons of of my life is by simply taking the time at the end of the day, praying a prayer, a particular kind of prayer, a prayer that, for lack of a better word, I've come to just call my prayer of recollect. My prayer of recollect. To recollect, of course is to go back, right? It's to go back over something and to recall it, to sort of relive it in your mind. And so in my prayer, this prayer of recollect, I simply go back over the day, almost replaying the day like a movie in my mind. You know, thinking back to when I got up and some of the first things that I did, um, revisiting every conversation over the course of the day, kind of replaying every task that I was engaged in, every meeting maybe that I was part of. And as I'm, as I'm walking through it all again, I'm simply asking God, I'm inviting God, I invite the Spirit to walk through the day with me as I replay it in my mind and I invite the Spirit to show me, to reveal to me where He was at work. Show me, God, where you were. As I I now sort of revisit that conversation, as I now walk through again that that task, where were you, God? Show me where you were real. Show me what you were doing. Show me what pleased you. Show me me what what, um, disappointed you. Basically, what I'm doing is asking God to simply show me, teach me where he was present. That's basically all this prayer of recollect is. It's a, it's a prayer where I invite God to open my eyes so that I can see where he's been walking with me on the road. 
when I've taken the time and when I've developed the discipline to pray that way each night, it's given me dozens and dozens of opportunities to see God, to see the Spirit at work in my life in ways that I would have otherwise missed. I've found lots of examples, unfortunately, as I replay the day. I've found lots of examples where I wasn't fully present to God. Of course, I seek forgiveness for those times. But I've also found lots of examples of times where God was fully present to me. Many times I've realized at the end of the day, praying, praying this prayer of recollect, that that thing or, or that person that I thought had been an interruption was actually God showing something of himself to me. Jenny and I were, were away on a sabbatical a few years ago, and, and for three of those weeks, just over three of those weeks, we were... We were in Florida, and, and during that time, we flew, and we intentionally chose not to rent a car while we were there. We decide, decided to do everything by bus for those few weeks because we were wanting to slow down. That was part of the purpose of the sabbatical. And when you take the bus, you have no choice but to live slowly. It involves a lot of walking, and it involves a lot of waiting. Well, taking the bus opened up this, this whole new world to us. It was like a subculture that, that we weren't even aware of beforehand. There was lots of alcoholism. In fact, each time the bus doors opened and someone new stepped on, you could smell it even though you were halfway back the bus. And there was a lot of mental illness, people, people talking to themselves or or making odd gestures to themselves, or, or to us, to others. And we actually, we actually started recognizing some of the people on the routes that we traveled most often, the route that went to the beach, or the route that went downtown. We'd start to see some of the same people. They were regulars. They rode the same bus pretty well every day. And, and what began to become clear to us was that these people, as many needs as they might have, these people really, truly cared for one another. They would greet one another, you know, when, they, when someone came on board, their name would get called out by three or four others, hey, Joe, hey, Suits. They would ask one another about um, how that procedure went with, with the doctor last week. How did that go? They would share what little they had with one another. They would help one another get off the bus. One woman I remember getting off the bus many stops early in order to help another man who had mobility issues get off the bus. It was incredible witnessing all of this. And as I prayed through my day one night, that night actually, as I'm praying my prayer of recollect, I suddenly became aware, God suddenly made me aware that he was present in that community. Many of them were, were rough around the edges, no doubt about it, but they were caring for one another in ways that I sometimes don't even see in the church. And God was showing me that that was his grace. That was his care, that was his love that I had been witnessing these, these couple weeks. And I could have missed it. In fact, I did miss it until I deliberately took the time that evening to pray through my day and invite God to show me where he had been. There's something about us in I don't know, maybe a psychologist or a sociologist could explain that to me, but, but there's something about us that makes, us, it makes it easier for us sometimes to see things in retrospect, to see things as we look back. In the moment, we can, we can miss it. But looking back over the course of a day or looking back over the course of a week, we say, oh, yeah. 
Well, yeah, my heart was burning at that moment. That was Cleopas and Fred, right? On the road. They said our hearts were burning as Jesus was present. There's power in looking back. But here's something else I've learned too. As you develop that discipline of learning to regularly, faithfully look back, that discipline helps train you, helps help shape your mind and your heart so that you begin more often to begin to see Jesus in the present as well. Once you begin to see God's ways, once you begin to see God's habits, once you begin to see his patterns of how he works in our lives, you begin to recognize him more readily, more quickly. So as you leave here this morning, or those of you who are, who are online with us, as you... As, you, as we sort of wrap things up here today and you leave, I want you to know that God's not just here within these doors. He's not just here in this time slot each week that we share together. He's through these doors as well. Cleopas and Fred would agree. Practice attentiveness. There are times he's in the big and the showy. There are times he's in the wind. This is what we learn from Elijah, right? There are times he's in the wind or the fire or the earthquake. But typically, typically, he's in the whisper. That's where he dwells. That's where he makes himself known. That's where he makes himself heard. That's where he burns ever so slightly in your heart. Open your eyes. Open your ears. And practice the spiritual discipline of attentiveness. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we give you thanks that it's in you that we live and move and have our very being. We, all that we are and all that we have, it holds together in you. All things consist in Jesus. He's here. We know that. We confess that. But this morning, God, we've been reminded that you are not here alone. We need that reminder often because we, don't, we often miss you in the mundane. We often miss you in the patterns of the week. We often miss you in the rhythms of the day. We pray, God, that as we leave here today that your spirit would prompt us, remind us, gently prod us to look, to look, to see to believe you are real there is not a moment not a moment God where you are not real and where you are not really with us help us see your hope help us see your grace help us see your care help us see your good news for we pray it in Jesus name amen Praise team is going to come up and lead us in a song which I think is unfamiliar to many of us. The tune might sound familiar to many of you. The words certainly are not. The words are based on, um, well, I shouldn't say certainly not. Some of you may know it. But I know you haven't sang it here, or at least that's what I'm told. Um, but the words come to us right from Luke 24, the passage that we've just read this morning. And so to familiarize ourselves with it a little bit. The praise team is going to sing it through once for us. And maybe, in fact, we can even remain seated for that while they sing through that first verse. And then if you can just motion us to rise when you want us to join in, okay? And then by then, I think you'll have it. And we'll stand up and join them uh, as we sing in response to God.
Please be seated. We have an opportunity to come to God in prayer this morning, and um, is there anything we need to pray about? Clean water. Clean water. All right. Something else? Huh? Rain water. All right. I hear we're getting some. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, and we we uh, come into this place, Lord, and we we anticipate that your presence is going to be here, that your Holy Spirit is going to be here, that that um, that Lord, we are going to have an experience here, Lord. But as we heard this morning, Lord, you were with us when we woke up. You had breakfast with us. You uh, helped us get ready. You drove with us, or walked with us, or. And you even walked in with us. Um, help us, Lord, to live out what we've heard this morning and the fact that, we, that your presence is with us at all times. And so, Lord, we want to thank you for that. We want to thank you for your um, walking with us and your goodness and your faithfulness, even when we're missing it. So, Lord, we just thank you for that. But, Lord, we confess also that um, even though you are with us and, and that sometimes we don't feel the nudging and promptings of your, of your spirit in our lives, Lord, that the community, although we call ourselves a community church, Lord, we do not um, react, live with, help, minister to our community in the way that... that that, Lord, you would have us to do. So, Lord, as a church, I pray that we would, um, we would be more cognizant and more willing to uh, seek you out and say, Lord, how do we serve this community? How do we serve not only the community of believers within this, this body, our members, but how do we serve uh, the people who live beside us and the people who travel through this community? And how do we serve and show your presence to them as well. So, Lord, help us to know what to do for ministry. Help us to change the things that we do that, that, um, that we just do for the sake of doing them, Lord, because we've always done them. Lord, help us to be renewed and, and, and uh, to have new vision and new sight and new uh, encouragement and new spirit, Lord. Uh, I pray that you would... Um, increase in each and every one of us the spirits gifts that we have those things that we're already good at those things that you have blessed us with lord that we would use those and that lord the ministry and the work that we do here would be a uh, just an outpouring of what we already have within us lord so lord we pray that you would forgive us. I pray that you would be with ministries that are ongoing, Lord. I think of all youth programs, Lord. Uh, the, the Frankfurt Youth Center, we pray for Herb, that he too would have the strength and the ability to do the work there, that our own young people's, Lord, would, would thrive, and that, again, too, you would, you would uh, be blessing that and blessing the leaders and giving them what they need. I pray that you would bless the Bible studies that are going on and that you would bless ministry when just two people get together and have coffee. So Lord, I pray that you would just continue to, to bless that. Bless those who struggle, those who, um, Lord, who are suffering illness and who struggle from, uh, from age or from health or, or whatever it is, Lord. We pray that you would bring healing there as well and that you would bring renewed uh, strength. Lord, we grieve this week in the, the loss of our brother Keith. And so, Lord, I just pray a blessing upon his family. And, and, uh, and Lord, it was, as I came to the, uh, the visitation, and to see all the people that he touched in all the people's lives, and yet he was, he was quiet, and he was, he was humble, and and yet I looked at the impact that he had in his life, Lord. I pray that, 
that we would do more of that, that we would be humble in our walk and yet uh, mighty in our, our, our touch. So Lord, we pray that you would just continue to help us to be a church like that. Lord, we pray for rain. We pray that you would uh, replenish the earth once again, that you would help the crops to grow, to, to, um, to give us the rain in its time, to give us the sun in its time, and to, to make the harvest plentiful, Lord, that we might feed many and that many might be fed, Lord. We pray for clean drinking water around the world, Lord. We take it for granted. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to move in ministries and lives and communities that, again, too, fresh water and safe water would be available for all. We just pray now that you would just bless us in this day and in this week. Be with all those who are not here, Lord, who are camping or traveling, Lord. And, and Lord, we pray keep everyone safe, Lord. We, we take it for granted. We speak and we say we're going to this and this place next week. Yet, Lord, we do not know what might come, and, and, and travel is, is not a guarantee, Lord. And so, Lord, keep us safe. Lord, I pray that maybe you would open our eyes to the spiritual realm to see, Lord, the things that happen that keep us safe and that keep us uh, close to you, Lord. Uh, because, Lord, we, we take so much for granted. Uh, in that front as well. So Lord, cover us with your blood, cover us with your protection. Bless this service, bless all that we do, that you would be glorified in it. For Jesus' sake, amen. I'm so excited for you this week because you are going to see God at work. As you live with eyes open and ears open, you're going to see him at work right in your life, right in your home, right in your family, right in your neighborhood, right in your community. Yesterday, my, my, my grandson, who's here with me this morning, accidentally closed the door on my granddaughter's hand. It was a few tears on both parts because he felt so badly. And he walked up to her and he said, unprompted, he said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. Will you forgive me? And as I look back on that now with eyes open, God's saying, I'm growing my spirit in him. That spirit of grace and compassion, feeling another's pain and uh, seeking grace and forgiveness, living that out, God was saying, that's me. That's me at work. You're going to see him this week as you go into work and you're discouraged uh, at a particular moment in the day and someone's going to say just the right word or you're going to receive just the right email. And when you look back, God's going to whisper in your ear, that was my word of encouragement for you. That was me. I was with you. I knew what you needed. You're going to be driving home one night and there you're going to see this beautiful orange ball in the heavens. And God is going to say, that's my handiwork. He's going to whisper it into your spirit. That's me at work, creating creator God, my hands, my shaping. I'm excited for you this week because you're going to see him in dozens of different ways. He wants to send you on your way to do just that. So I invite you to stand and to receive his word of blessing. People of God whom I love, God would say, open your eyes to see me. I'm with you, my child. Open your ears to hear me. I'm speaking to you, my child. Know that I walk with you. Know that I go with you. Know that everywhere you set your foot is holy ground, because I am present. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's people together said, Amen.
Let's be. 